We turn now for our scripture reading to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. We find here in this passage the Jews and their unbelief, opposing Jesus, arguing with him, treating him disrespectfully, and blaspheming him, all the while claiming that Abraham was their father, and more than that, that God was their father. Jesus, in John chapter 8, corrects the Jews in their unbelief. And we pick up the reading in chapter 8 and verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. And by the way, that is the reason for the crucifixion. The reason they killed him is because he told the truth. Jesus continues. He says, Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, here's more disrespect. We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. So those are the claims that they make. Abraham is our Father and God is our Father. Jesus proceeds to correct them. And it is an amazing statement coming from the Son of God. Verse 44, You are of your Father, the devil. The word in the Greek, diabolos. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus clearly believed in the reality of this fallen angel, this diabolos, the devil calling him a murderer and a liar, and he is indeed a black hole of deception. He says there is no truth in him. Now today we're going to look at the issue of the surpassing riches of grace. We're going to look briefly at Colossians chapter 1 and then spend the rest of our time in the book of Ephesians. We have three points. Number one, and all of these are exhortations coming to us from Holy Scripture. Number one, let us give thanks to the Father. Number two, let us spend time reflecting. Number three, let us understand our Christian lives. We begin then with giving thanks to the Father. And we turn now to Colossians chapter 1. And I would remind you of the startling statement of the Apostle Paul as we come to Colossians 1. A statement made in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 in which he says that you as believers were once linked to the devil. He says you formerly walked according to the prince of the power of the air. He is saying that his influence was always lurking in the background. We may have been oblivious to that fact, but the statement stands that we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. Now as we come to Colossians chapter 1, Paul here, beginning in verse 12, is giving thanks to God the Father that he, the Father, the first person of the Trinity, moved us out of the devil's house into a new house, a house of light. And he is in a posture of giving thanks to the Father. The focus here is not upon the Son. It is not so much upon the Holy Spirit. It is upon God the Father. Colossians 1.12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of 
the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. You'll note here what the Father has done. The Father, he says, and I read from the New American Standard Bible, in verse 13, he says he has rescued us from the domain of darkness. The word that Paul uses there, translated rescued, the word ruamai, means that God has removed us from a place of peril by a personal intervention. We tend to think almost exclusively upon the personal interventions of the Holy Spirit in applying redemption to us, but we must not forget that there is also a personal intervention of God the Father. There was a personal intervention where we were actually rescued, he says, from the domain of darkness that is a place without light a place where we live without an understanding of the truth of Scripture. The person who is in that position, according to the Apostle Paul, is in the domain of darkness. But Paul also speaks about our present abode of blessing. The New American Standard Bible continues with verse 13, and it says, And has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. You note those two words. We have redemption, apolutrosis. The idea here is that we have deliverance from enslavement by the payment of a ransom. The ransom price, according to the New Testament, is the blood of the Messiah. And we also have the forgiveness of sins. The word there is aphesis. There's been a cancellation of our liabilities and debts brought on by our sins. This is what we have as we are in this kingdom of the beloved Son of God. As we come to point number two, the Holy Spirit in writing the book of Ephesians wants us to spend time reflecting Reflecting, first of all, upon the devil's morgue. Now, if we were not to remember this, Paul would not be writing about this. He would not be bringing this to our attention. And therefore, we need to remember the past. And if we do that, there will be no basis for pride in the present. There is no basis for you or for me to have an air of superiority with reference to other people who are unsaved. Because your corpse and my corpse, according to Paul, was stacked up in the devil's morgue just like every other corpse in there. Note this remarkable statement, Ephesians 2.1. He says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Striking imagery that we were dead spiritually but at the same time we were alive that is biologically. That is the most that we were. We were alive biologically but we were not alive spiritually. We were dead to the things of God. And all of that is manifested in the lifestyle that he lays out for us in verses 2 through 3. Where the world and the flesh and the devil dominate. He says we walked according to the course of this world. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air. He says in verse 3, we fulfill the desires of the flesh, the sarks, the fallen, Adamic nature we gave in to it. And we did not really know, unless the Holy Spirit was working upon us, we did not even know, some of us, the reality that there is a place called Hades and Gehenna. And that the house that we were in was about to go up in flames. He says at the end of verse 3, we were by nature children of wrath just as others. We need to remember where we were. 
you and I dare not have an air of superiority. We need to recall our resurrection from the dead. And this is the great miracle that God does throughout the centuries in human history. He gives life to those who are spiritually dead. This is a description of the person who has been born again, the person who comes into the world a second time, the person who is born of God. But this is another way of looking at it. It is a, a movement from death into life. He says in Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead in trespasses, God made us alive. You'll note here that th this is called, theologians call this divine monergism. There is only one who is working, that is God. We could not work. We were dead. God intervened. There was an act of power. God made us alive. And what prompted God to do this? Well, here we need to contemplate the riches of divine mercy. Note Ephesians 2, 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. There's the word, alaas, the compassion, the mercy, the pity of God, which is expressed to those who are in great need. It's just not... A feeling of compassion but there is the compassion but there is action on the part of God it is a feeling which is actually expressed and Paul says that God is not stingy in his mercy that God possesses an abundance of mercy he has a wealth of mercy which he is willing to bestow upon us in our pitiful condition he says god is rich in mercy but he also says that standing behind the mercy is love notice ephesians 2 4 but god who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. He uses the noun agape in the verb agapao. His great love was behind this act of giving life to us. What is agape? Agape love is God reaching out because of his interest in the well-being of others. Listen to 1 John 4, 9. By this the love of God was manifested that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, listen, so that we might live. The incarnation, the Apostle John is saying, had that as its intention that blessing would come to us, that we might live. And Paul says that this love is great love. This is the highest degree of love. And it stood behind this act of God giving life to the dead. It's interesting that Paul in this epistle wants us to know about the love of the Father, but he also wants us to know about the love of the Son. And you note here in Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, that Paul is praying to the Father. He bows his knees to the Father, and here is his request, that he would grant you that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. He wants us to know that which we cannot fully know. And he is praying, we have to pray that we may come to know. John Bunyan, the great theologian of the 17th century in England, in his book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, speaks about how his soul, he says, my soul was led from truth to truth by God. That's what has to happen with us. And we have to pray that our soul would be led from truth to truth by God. And that is what God does, did for him. And he was praying that God would do that. And God answered his prayer. 
and he says that he has he read the Gospels and he this is 17th century English he says methought I was as if I had seen him born speaking about Jesus it, it as if I had seen him grow up, as if I had seen him walk through this world from the cradle to his cross, to which also when he came I saw how great gently he gave himself to be hanged and nailed on it for my sins and wicked doings. You notice he does not have a detached view in his interaction with Scripture. Bunyan senses that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, did that for him. And he was led from truth to truth by God. See, that's what God does. If we will ask him to do that, we will be led from truth to truth by God himself. Point number three, we need to understand our Christian lives we need to understand that we still struggle with sin. Now Paul has been writing about this new birth, this resurrection from the dead. John Newton wrote about it, the great 17th century pastor. It is him, Amazing Grace, and you remember he said how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Now listen, was blind, but now I see. Now that's what God does, and that's what Paul's writing about in Ephesians chapter 2. We were blind, but now we see. But we are still living upon the earth, and we still make mistakes. We still fall short. We still blunder. We can still do foolish things. We can still say things that we should not say. We can still draw wrong conclusions. And that is why in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, God tells us what we are to do and what we are not to do. God does not have a laissez-faire policy with us. God does not say, I do not need to tell them how to live because they already know how to live. After all, they have been born again. Actually, we do not know how to live. We do not know what right and wrong are. There is much ethical confusion by nature in the life of the person who has been born again. That is why Paul writes Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. Let me point out the one thing that he says we are to do, and it's the first thing that we find here in Ephesians 4, 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And by the way, that's Ephesians 1, 2, 3. The calling with which you are called, the effectual summons of God to faith in Jesus Christ. Now that has happened, and now you have to, he says, have a walk worthy. And I just want you to see the very first thing that comes to the mind of Paul in a worthy walk. What is it? It is humility. With all lowliness. But it's so interesting that he is writing to those, as he puts it in Ephesians 1, who are the elect of God, who have been redeemed, who have had their sins forgiven, who have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. But he has to tell them there are things in your life you really have to get rid of. Ephesians 4.25, you need to put away lying. Ephesians 4.26, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Ephesians 4.28, you need to stop stealing. Remember, he is writing to a Christian congregation. To those who have been born again. 
And we're reminded of the power of the old nature. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Ephesians 4.31 Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. He's writing to a Christian congregation. He says, do not do these things. And probably the most moving statement here in the second half of Ephesians, chapters 4 through 6, is Ephesians 4.30. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. The word is lupeo. Do not bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit. Do not distress the Holy Spirit by your self-centered, unloving life, he says to the church in Ephesus. And all of this shows the powerful, corrupt part that remains in the life of the man, the woman who has been born again. We are still sinners. But the amazing thing is that we are legally righteous before God. On the one hand, we constantly make confession of sin. On the other hand, we perfectly measure up to the standard of the law of God. Luther used that expression, seemingly used thus at peccator. We are simultaneously righteous and sinful at the same time. That classic text, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul says, For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Our sins were laid upon him that happened at the cross. Now, what was the intention? He says that we might become. Notice, become. is something that has to happen. That we might become. The righteousness of God in Him. Now we become the righteousness of God by receiving. Romans 5.17, those who receive the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So we have to understand that about the Christian life. Simul justus et peccator. Sinful, but righteous. Now that's a major theme in Paul's writings. That whole doctrine of an imputed righteousness, the doctrine of justification, that is the heart of the gospel. And Paul is constantly talking about that in his epistles. You see it in Romans, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, Titus. But what's so interesting is, is that here in Ephesians, he brings in another perspective and he tells us where we are seated. And this is profoundly mysterious. Here in Ephesians chapter 2, you'll notice with me in verses 5 and 6 that God has done three things for us. Again, this is monergism. It's God who does these things. We contribute nothing in this description in verses 5 and 6. He made us alive, he raised us up, and he made us sit in the heavenly places. Note here Ephesians 2, 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So life was given. And just as Christ was raised up out of death, we too are raised up because we're joined to him. And Christ went into heaven at the ascension. And Paul says that God has made us sit together in the heavenly places. He is saying that we are seated positionally and legally in heaven right now. Even while... We are here upon this earth. 
this is a mystery that our minds cannot get around. Martin Luther wrote about this. It's not on the back of your outline. It's from his commentary on Galatians. I'm going to begin reading at line 8, and it's just two sentences. It's two sentences that you could spend a long time thinking about. On the one hand, Luther presents a reality that we all know experientially. In line 8, he says, I am indeed a sinner as touching this present life. You notice this present life here on the earth. I'm a sinner. I am indeed a sinner as touching this present life and the righteousness thereof as the child of Adam, where the law accuseth me, death reigneth over me, and at length would devour me. Now we know that experientially. But there's another reality that Luther brings to our attention. And we know these truths by faith. He says, but I have another righteousness and life above this life. Notice what he's doing. On the one hand, there's this present life here on the earth. On the other hand, there's this other life which is above. A life above this life. It's a life in heaven. And it's really bound up in Christ. He says, which is Christ, the Son of God, who knoweth no sin nor death, but is righteousness and life eternal. Remember that. That's what Paul is talking about there in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, that we are seated in the heavenly places. And then this amazing statement. We all know that Salvation has not come to our physical bodies yet. We have not yet been saved from disease, from mortality, and from death. This is a second coming event. It's future. And Luther directs our attention to that. He says, by whom even this my body, being dead and brought to dust, shall be raised up again and delivered from the bondage of the law and sin and shall be sanctified together with the Spirit. What an amazing event. Our body sanctified with the Spirit. Man is body and soul, body and spirit, both sanctified. So what's going to happen in the future? We come to our last sub-point. Paul teaches we will receive divine kindness forever. Why did God do all of this? Why did he make us alive? Why did he raise us up? Why did he seat us in heaven? Note what he says here in Ephesians 4 and verse 7 that in the ages to come, now here he's speaking about the final state. He's speaking about the consummation order. He's speaking about the coming kingdom of God. And he calls it the ages to come. We're not there yet. We are in this present age. We are not yet in the ages to come. But what is going to happen then? I read from the New American Standard Bible, so that he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. That's what's going to happen in the ages to come. That is what God is going to do. And how is he going to show us the attribute of grace? He is going to display his grace in the way that he treats us. Now, we're thinking here about the first person of the Trinity, the Father. He says in Ephesians 2, 7, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace, look at this, in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We see his grace in his, the word is Christotes, kindness. We see his grace in his sweetness and in his goodness in his interactions with us. 
Our Heavenly Father is not a cold, hard, unfeeling, unforgiving Father. Every day, as it were, there will be new acts of kindness and new moments of sweetness which he will bestow upon his children. There will be no unkind words coming from God the Father in his house. We will experience sweetness and kindness forever and ever. Now, all of that's called eschatology, the doctrine of future things. How does eschatology, the future, apply to present day ethics right now? Notice what Paul says, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. He's speaking about God the Father. He says, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. It's sort of like a, um, a son who imitates his father. That's what sons do. They imitate the way the father stands, the way the father expresses himself, and he is saying, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. What does it mean to walk in love? Well, note Ephesians 4.32, he says, be kind to one another. There's the word Christos. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So as we think about the kindness of God the Father to us as children, particularly in eternity, Paul says right now, imitate God, walk in love, be kind to one another.